from Nashville, Tennessee. This is the day the Lord has made. Join us for the next 30 minutes as we share the gospel ministry of Dale and Jerry Robbins. Thank you for helping us to keep making these video presentations. Make your donation online at victorious.org forward slash donate. Once again, that's victorious.org forward slash donate. Thanks again for your faithfulness. May God richly bless you. Some time ago, someone asked an interesting question. 
Why does the Bible say not to love the world or the things of the world when Jesus seemed to contradict that very idea by saying that God so loved the world that he sent his son to save the world? Uh, that's a great question, especially since there's such little preaching or teaching anymore these days about what we used to call worldliness. Both passages refer to um, something that comes from the writings of the Apostle John. In his first epistle or letter written to other Christians, in 1 John 2, 15 and 17, he said this. He said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. But then, in his gospel, John 3 through 16, which is uh, an eye eyewitness account of the uh, life in the uh, sacrifice, uh, crucifixion of Jesus, resurrection. He quotes one of the most famous statements that Jesus ever recorded. It's so well known, you may have even seen it displayed sometimes on placards held, held up at NFL games as an effort by those to share the gospel message of Christ on TV or, uh, you know, once they scan the crowd. This verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's from John chapter 3 and verse 16. Now these references may sound contradictory, but they're not. They're simply referring to different things. In the Bible, the term world can refer to the earth and, and the physical universe, but most often it's a reference to all humanity, that is, the entire world of people, or else the fallen nature of our world and its inhabitants. When Jesus said that God so loved the world, he was talking about all the people of the earth, that is, the billions of offspring from Adam and Eve who were our first parents that he created and placed in the Garden of Eden, who then unfortunately sinned and passed on their fallen nature to their descendants. That, that means you and me and every soul who has ever lived on this planet. God's love for mankind doesn't mean that he loves everything that people do or say or the horrendous evil that many people have done. God detests sin and cannot bless sin or evil, nor, or, nor can he bless those who give themselves over to such things. But he loves the souls of mankind in the same way a parent loves their child, even if that son or daughter grows up to make bad choices or does evil things. I'll never forget decades ago when my mother discovered many of the wicked and sinful things that I was involved in as a teenager and in, in, in my early adulthood. I was actually in a hospital emergency room of all places when confronted by my mother, but she did not come to uh, condemn me or, or, or come at me with anger, hatred, over the evil that it was apparent in my life, but she was simply heartbroken and sad that the little soul that she had loved and nourished had made poor choices with his life. Had she uh, responded in any other way at that time, the results may have been different, but when I saw her broken heart and compassion for me, it broke my heart too, and was, was the beginning of how God ended up bringing me to him is when my heart began to break over my mother's love for me. This is exactly the kind of love that God has for the souls of the world and why he sent Jesus to die in behalf of our sins. Once again, to be clear, God hates sin and evil, but he loves the souls of every man, woman and child in the world, which is why he sent Jesus and why we must love them too. 
On the other hand, when John says, do not love the world or the things in the world, as we um, read er moments ago, he's referring to the corrupt and sinful affections of our fallen world that Satan has continued to use as his influence since our first parents' disobedience to God in the Garden of Eden. To explain briefly, I don't want to get too theological here, but just as a brief explanation, Adam and Eve's fall to sin brought unimaginable catastrophe to the world and to God's original plan. Until the effects of that fall to sin, earth was a far different place where there was no sickness, no death, no wickedness or corruption. God met the needs of Adam and Eve and there was no lack of any kind on the earth. It was an organic realm of God's beauty and creation where he created man to dwell and to rule over the earth. That is until God's arch enemy Satan showed up and devised a plan to overthrow and hijack man's dominion. Now some may ask why God even allowed the devil to be present in the garden or upon the earth, but the Bible explains elsewhere that uh, his origin as Lucifer, one of God's three archangels, who with along with as many as a third of all the angels of heaven rebelled against God and were cast out of heaven to the earth, as it says and describes in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 15 through 18. Open your Bible there and, and look at that, and you'll be surprised at, at what you discover. But, but why would God put man in the same place as the devil, and where he knew man could be tempted by Satan's evil and rebellion? Well, the whole point of this was to give Adam and Eve something remarkable. It may uh, be a surprise to many people, but this was to give something to Adam and Eve. That was the free gift of a free will. He made man not to be a mechanic, uh, mechanical android to simply obey his commands, to pull a string and make him say uh, recorded uh, messages, but he created man as a living soul with a free will to make his own choices and determinations. This was very important to God for an amazing reason, because God desired to be loved and worshipped by divinely created beings who had the freedom to choose whether to love him or not to love him, whether to choose him or not to worship him. As any of us can attest, the most critical component to genuine love is the free will. There is no pleasure or fulfillment in a love that is forced, programmed, or where there is no other alternative. Any of us could go out and purchase uh, programmable dolls. If you remember the little doll called Chatty Cathy, you remember that one? I, I'm not sure if our daughter had that one when she was little, but she had other puppet uh, dolls. I think Teddy Ruspin, Ruspin is that was, that was his name? He, he uttered a recorded message, and it was almost lifelike, except it wasn't lifelike. But we could go out and get such dolls and program them to tell us, I love you, I love you, I love you, over and over. But, but just how much meaning does that have? Did, would that fulfill your desire to be loved, your desire for fellowship, to sit there with an with a, uh, empty-headed doll? who just said what you programmed it to say? Well, of course not. Um, unless it has a mind of its own, this is just empty and, and means nothing. Unless it, it has its own free will to do something else, it doesn't mean anything. You see, this is God's most amazing gift to mankind, at least I think, the free will. And even though he doesn't want anyone to be deceived or to be lost for eternity, this is why he allowed Satan to be here on the earth to give man an alternate choice. It was so man could choose either to love God or reject God, so that he could choose God or the devil, that so that he could choose either good or evil, righteousness or sin. 
Unfortunately, Adam and Eve's humanity used their free will to make a very bad choice. While Adam and Eve were clothed with human flesh, they were made primarily spiritual in nature so that they could walk in perfect fellowship with God, who is a spirit. And Satan realized their relationship with God gave them power over him, but he thought, what if he could find a way to trick man's lower nature of his flesh to rise up and persuade it to disobey God and break that spiritual fellowship with him? This is exactly what he did as he used the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil to appeal to the desires of their lower flesh. And they broke the one law God gave them and ate of the, the tree of that fruit, which uh, he, God forbade them to do. The rest is history. They disobeyed God. He invoked the curse of sickness, toil, and death upon the earth and mankind. And Satan gained a substantial upper hand to the effect that Jesus re repeatedly called him the ruler and the prince of this world in John chapter 12, chapter 14, and chapter 16. And Paul referred to the devil as the God and the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2 and verse 2. However, here we go, the great news here is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, God already knew that this was going to happen, and he already devised a plan to rescue man from man's choice of, of sin by sending Jesus to give his own life on the cross as our substitute, taking the curse of sin and death upon himself, so by believing upon him and his atoning sacrifice, we could be set free from Satan's dominion and the horrible consequences of this curse. As Paul wrote, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Galatians 3 verse 13. Jesus Christ brings forgiveness of your sins and mine and the promise of salvation which sets us free from the curse of sin and death. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. At another time, I'll, I'll talk more about what, what our redemption from that curse means um, and the great atonement of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But I've touched on this briefly to help you to see how that Satan has historically exercised an influence between man's fleshly nature and this physical world and how he continues to use this method to entice and manipulate man's behavior. Now this brings us back to John's epistle and explains why he warns us, do not love the world or the things in the world. Uh, he's not suggesting that everything in this world is evil, because we certainly can see the beauty of God's creation and his natural wonders, but, but that no thing or desire of this world must be allowed to come between our devotion and obedience to God, which is how Satan originally deceived and manipulated Adam and Eve in the beginning, by appealing to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. God created man with many legitimate physical needs and desires that the Lord wants to see fulfilled in the lives of all his followers. But he doesn't want any of us to put our affections or devotions on such things as John described, if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The things of this corporal world stand in stark contrast to God's kingdom, and we cannot be fully devoted both to God and to this world, or the pleasures or the possessions of this world, which are only temporal, while the things of God and His kingdom are eternal. When a person's affections are devoted to this world, that's what they live for. The desires of their flesh is their God, and they do whatever they, they must to please their flesh, to pre please themselves. In fact, James said, 
This kind of living puts us at odds with God. That living for the world actually makes us his enemy. He said, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I, I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. James 4 and verse 4. The follower of Christ, however, doesn't live to please self or the world or to, to fulfill themselves through the sin and the lusts and the evil desires of this world, but they find joy pleasing and honoring the one who gave his life for their salvation. Instead of being ruled by their flesh and its evil desires, which serves the interests of the devil, the spirit-led believer rules over their own flesh and keeps it restrained on a leash, permitting it to be behave in a way that pleases the Lord. Now here's how the New Testament, the, that is in the New Living Translation, puts it. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are of this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. 1 John 2, 15-17. I've sometimes heard Christians say that no one's going to tell them how to live or what to do. They have a right to do as they please. But the Apostle Paul said, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 you see, this is the great transaction that occurred when you gave your heart to Jesus. He became your body of sin on the cross in your place as your substitute, taking that sin, your sin, upon himself. But in exchange, you also became the body of Jesus here on the earth in his place, ministering and serving as his hands and feet here in this world. You and your other brothers and sisters in Christ are his body, the body of Christ. And you represent him and the things that he taught to the world. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you already have, you're probably familiar with this verse from Romans, as I read. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10. And as simple as that sounds, that is as simple as it takes to become a Christian today and to become a follower of Jesus, to believe upon him, to confess him with your mouth, to believe in your heart, uh, what he has done for you in his atonement and sacrifice on the cross, that Jesus Christ is Lord. But have you considered what it means for Jesus to be Lord? What does that mean? Lord means master, boss, or ruler. It means he's the one in charge. He's the one for whom you live, the one you obey. Making Jesus Lord of your life means you have submitted yourself to him. He's your boss now, and your life is no longer um, focused on pleasing yourself and just doing your own thing in the world. The focus of your life is upon pleasing God, pleasing the Lord, the one who rules, the master of your life, who gave his life for you on the cross and purchased your redemption. You had no way out. Sin would condemn you to eternity in uh, the, the, the devil's place of punishment for, for forever, except that Jesus came, died for you on the cross, gave his heart, and in exchange, what do we give back to him? 
our life, the same life that He redeemed, the life that He saved through His brutal sacrifice upon the cross, that you could have life everlasting, and that life we dedicate to live for Him and to serve Him. And uh, when you become a Christian, there becomes a desire in your heart to want to follow the Lord, His teachings and the things that we find in the Word of God. And there's a desire to want to please Him and to represent Him. And that uh, um, has oftentimes a conflict with our old fleshly man who wants to take us back and do our own thing again and live for ourselves. But we surrender ourselves to the appetites of God's Spirit in our heart and we follow Him. The devil will always give us a run for our money and always be tempting us to go back and to, to draw aside and to live for the flesh again. But we continue to give our, ourselves to the Lord. And this is, this is what we are talking about by worldliness. There are Christians who have uh, abandoned this message that I'm, I'm talking to you about today and they have just uh, accepted the, the, the idea, the false idea that they can be a Christian and yet live in the world too. But as we can see from the Word of God, that's just not true. Once we receive Christ, we're a new creature. We, we have a new citizenship in heaven and our life has to be different. We have different ambitions and goals and purpose. When we die, we're going to go to a different place. And that is to heaven rather than, than to hell. And we must live our lives in such a way that we represent Jesus in this world. I want to pray for you today. If you uh, are not living as you should with the Lord today, serving Him, let this be the day that you say, Jesus, uh, forgive me for my sins and shortcomings. And Lord, I want to rededicate myself to live for you, that you would be Lord of my life and the things I do and my appetites. Lord, I pray that today, Lord, you would draw my friends into a deeper relationship with you and to abandon the old world and its desires uh, in the way that uh, it wants us to live. Help us to live for you, Lord Jesus, to serve you and to honor you with our lives. And for those who don't know you, that have never received you, let them just simply to invite you into their heart today. Come in, Jesus, help me to live for you and serve you with my life, in Jesus' name. As simple as that is, that's all that it takes. And go to the address on your screen that we've shown you throughout the program, and it'll tell you more how to live your life for Jesus. So, until next time, I want you to know we love you, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you for being with us today. For more information, please visit our website at victorious.org. Until next time, God bless you.